married. Wait, wait, I hear you say that is not Messian. I tuned into Decomposing Messian to hear more about the techniques of my musical language, the textbook written by Olivier Messian, and uh, through which we have been working over the last few months, chapter by chapter, episode by episode, looking at the different techniques of his musical language. But today, that wasn't Messian, was it? No, that was Charles Ives. What I hope to do today is walk through some thinking about uh, actually playing the piano. And this was prompted by uh, that chord progression in Ives that I'm trying to work through. And some of the uh, some of the ways I was practicing it made me think of uh, something that Messian said about playing the piano. Messian considered himself uh, someone who had progressed pianist pianistic technique through his writing. Um, and he talks about that in some interviews um, with um, some interviews with Claude Samuel. And so I'm going to talk about that. So we'll start with um, with Messian talking about piano technique. And then I, I want to talk more generally about what it is to touch touch the piano with your fingers and the idea that, that composition, particularly with people like Messian and indeed like Ives, the tactic, the tactic, the tacticity, the haptics of the instrument are very important. And that in some ways the scores can be read as choreography for the hand, for the hands. And the word that I use um, is haptics. And haptics uh, refers to kind of the, the abstraction of the gestures required to do something. In this case, to play the piano, but you could have haptics of any other instrument. You could have the haptics of a game controller on your computer. Um, and in, in, in all of those cases, we're concerned about the, the motions of the body that are required to complete the, complete the task. It's a little bit of Ives, it's a Messian. Um, and then at the end, I, I've written about this. I've written about the idea of, of haptics and composition from my own experience and my own thoughts as a, as a, as a composer who's trying to think about these kinds of things. Um, so at the end, I'm gonna read um, a section from an, from an essay I wrote about that. Well, let's start at the beginning. If I go back to the piano, now, there, there's a way to think about playing the piano where when you're faced with a chord like this into a chord like this, and here, to this, you see when I, when I play the individual notes, I can just about lay my hand and hold them down. But how do you move from one to the other? Well, obviously, f for one thing, I can't have a nice alignment here, right? Like I, I like playing with a good arch here, but I obviously can't do that here because my fifth finger then, but I need to get it up, up there, right? Can't do it. And I was trying to practice this and think, what am I, am I just gonna, just, could I just roll it, right? Which is what pianists do when they can't reach the interval. They roll it and it's kind of, a, it's kind of accepted. But I, I don't think that's what I've wanted here. I think you want that cluster. So I, what I realize is you, not only do you have to move in, right? If I move in, see what I'm doing with my thumb. My thumb is hitting both. It's a nice chord. And you know what? I don't know that Ives would notice it. If I threw the thumb in in all of those and played a double note at the bass, then the chord progression would. So I could just recompose it, and I don't think anyone would notice. But yeah, that might fly with Ives, but it won't fly with Messian. So what I was, I, I was if I if I'm in like. Oh, that's such a, a weird. It 
it's such a weird position of the hand that I could really imagine Ives like. That's just how he played the piano. I think. Boom. In instead of this position, he 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 needs you to play sort of in and weeded, like roll the hand in. So as I was practicing this, I felt very akin to Ives. I felt like I was mirroring his playing because to, I still struggle a little bit, but to do it, you kind of have to think, oh, I'm going to play like this. Uh, the score, to play the score, I kind of have to mimic the behavior of the person playing the piano who wrote it. And that the score then becomes uh, as much about capturing the idiosyncrasies of the player as it is about the actual music. Do you see what, you see what I'm saying? I don't think I've sat here and thought, oh, I'm going to voice lead. Uh, 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 uh. I don't think he was voice leading five notes in clusters. I think he was playing. Put his hand down and then came up with those notes. And to play them, you kind of have to think that way as well. It's particularly true, I think, also later on where you have these, um, where you have these um, um, overlapping rhythms in sixes and fives across large measures. Uh, I don't think he wants me to meticulously count out the irrational rhythms like I would if I was playing Boulez, for example, or some of Stockhausen. I think what he wants is just this feeling of your hands hitting the keys in a certain way. Uh, oh, I'm sure I added it in, but this is from the Ives three-page sonata, which of course is ten pages. Uh, a concert of just pieces of music where the title indicates a length that is then not not the length. I can think of two right now. Um, the Ives three-page sonata, which I'm sure in manuscript is three big dense pages, but here it's ten pages. And then Philip Glass um, has uh, music in two pages, which is published in three pages. So you would think if you're publishing it, you would go to the effort of making it the, the title. Uh, there's probably more. I just can't, can't think of it. And I might write one. I might write... Uh, Sonata in five pages and have it be two pages, something like that. So my touch at the piano is very influenced by the sort of turn of the 20th century style, epitomized by Alfred Cortot. My teacher studied with Cortot, and I practiced the technical exercises that Cortot established. And those are very different from Ives. If Ives is like this, the Courtois exercises start, they start like this. So you can see my arch, it's beautiful, right? And then I've depressed all the keys without sounding, and then I start from there. And there are different patterns. And the idea here is that there's full weight. Like I've got I'm basically leaning into the keys right now and the challenge is to keep the elbow loose and limber. The finger is holding the weight, but really like no matter how quietly I'm playing or loudly, there's the same control in the, in the fingers. And if, It's a, it's a lever of the weight of the arm in through the fingers, right? See, when I play, even when I always keep it. And so when I write music for the piano, or improvise or 
whatever I'm doing there. Uh, that shapes what I can and cannot do. Uh, <laughs> I'm never going to write a five note cluster like that because it doesn't come naturally. So the, the choreography of the instrument determines um, the, um, the, 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 the score uh, is really a psychological artifact that, that captures, the, um, captures the relationship of the composer with the instrument as much as it does the relationship of the composer with the, with the notes. Uh, for for example, in the introduction to the to the rational principles of pianoforte technique that Courtauld writes, um, he has this introduction. In the beginning of this work, we stated that we thought it possible to group all the problems of pianistic execution into five essential categories. We conceive this classification in the following manner: equality, independence, and mobility of fingers. Fair enough. That's the first set of exercises. Passing the thumb under in scales and arpeggios, uh, double notes and polyphonic playing, extensions, which were the leaps we talked about, uh, and the wrist technique, the execution of chords, because to play more than one at a time really requires the weight here. But and then he says we consider that in the whole literature of the pianoforte, no difficulty exists which cannot be placed under one of the preceding headings. And I suppose if you were to extend wrist technique to include what I'm talking about here, this kind of like roll in that I think is the Ivesian choreography at the piano, then he's correct. But I bet that, it, that he didn't consider that. And in fact, as I haven't gone through these exercises, there's nothing there about playing, playing, cl playing clusters because he's really talking about uh, Bach, Chopin, and and for him, contemporary composers like Debussy and Ravel. All right, great, great. I hear you say that's fine, but this is the uh, decomposing Messian. So where's our Messian? All right, here's the quote. Uh, so these interviews with Claude Samuel, I've referred to them quite a bit because they do represent an evolution of the ideas that are in the techniques of my musical language. The interviews took place first in the 60s, and then they revisited the, uh, the content maybe 10, 15 years later. Kept the original interviews, but where, need, where needed, they either provided additional information or some, or some clarification. Uh, so the interviews are really, they're wonderful and they're quite far reaching, but there's one section where um, Messian is asked about what he thinks he's contributed in terms of progress. And he talks about rhythm, because I think that's fair enough, right, to say that Messian has, in his music, figured out new ways of extending rhythm as a, as a, as a structural element. Uh, we've, we talked about that a lot earlier on. Uh, but then he says something interesting. He says he considers um, some innovations in pianistic techniques. Now he starts by saying, I've often played and replayed the 12 pieces contained in Iberia by Abinis without attaining perfection for they're so terribly difficult. I'll never be able to play them like Yvonne Loriot, Loriot, um, uh, Loriot the pianist who uh, be became his second wife and was really the principal interpreter of his, of his piano music. Uh, it's nice to hear Messian say that he plays these pieces without attaining perfection. Of course, we do not attain perfection in our playing, and Messian is a very good, uh, a very good keyboard player, f fantastic organist, um, and a very good pianist. Uh, but obviously, aware of his limitations. If you look at the music for two pianos, the Vision de la Main, there's a clear difference between the part that he was going to play and the part that Lario was going to play, and he's aware of that. He, he speaks about that difference. The thematic material that can be um, extended and played with a bit more um, a bit more flexibility is in his part and the pieces that are virtuosic and difficult all go to the second pianist. So then he says uh, in the section that I'm really thinking about here 
he says, another effect consists of laying the hand when flat, when attacking with the four fingers, with the thumb bedded as a pivot. The hand is turned around the thumb and the four fingers are now to the right, now to the left of the thumb. And he considers this here, this motion here, to be his contribution to pianistic technique. So let's look at that for a moment uh, and then look at a, an example in the, in the music. So flat, you know, I like to play with a nice arch. <laughs> For French music, French scale chords music, for music that wants more of a of a harp-like effect on the piano. It's actually easier to do that with a, with flat fingers. I'll tell you why. Um, this isn't about why. So what Messian is saying is put your put your fingers flat like this. So you got four fingers here, and then the thumb. You see how? Uh, what it allows you to do is to not worry about specific notes so much, like. Um, sections of Messiaen that look furiously difficult because you've got if you were to uh, you really just have to think of it more as like a uh, and the fingers are just kind of in fact I practiced um, I find it really, really fucking delightful to think of Messian, this extraordinarily gifted, coherent, articulate composer, describing his piano, piano technique as flopping. I kind of imagine Kermit playing with the big flippers, right? You barely need an opposable thumb, or maybe you need just an opposable thumb. That motion here, the first thing that a person should learn when they learn how to play the piano. There's an example of this, uh, tons of examples. Uh, I'm going to pick at random, really just at random. Um, page 53 of Avant Regards Sur l'Enfant Jesus, which is part of number eight. Look at all those Look at all those notes, right? You got an A sharp, right? Look, I mean, just look at all those notes. You got an A sharp, a C sharp, D sharp, an E sharp, then a G sharp, and an F sharp, and then it's, all right? And then, uh, but look what that really is. Flap, flop, flap, 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 flop. And then it's not even play, 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 play. It's like flippy, flippy. Flip, 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 flip. You gotta make the funny noise too. You gotta go flip while you play. Flip, flip. Now Gould would sing along in counterpoint when he's playing Bach. I sing along with Muppet sounds when I play Messiaen. Flip, 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 flip. Right? And then, um, let me pick another page. Uh, another page, this one is page 13, which is the second page of number four. Regarde de la Vierge. Look at the furious notes. You've got a, 
you got an E in this, and then you've got this and this. Look how high up it all is. And then in the left hand, yeah, and then an F sharp and A, and then a. Uh, but but the left hand is, is just that, and the right hand is the same thing. I just have to go from here to here, right? Here to here. That's it. That's the hard part. The hard, yes, the hard part is getting from here to here. The, the easy part is this. Uh, so really, the hard, the two hard things are this to this, and then this to this. That's the whole. That's the whole section. So that's a good way to get the blood flowing in the morning. Uh, it is quite early still here. I've, I've realized that Saturday mornings um, are, the, are the best time. And, uh, you know, I do this podcast in the mornings during the weekdays. It gets out at about 6 o'clock in the morning because I'm up at around 4. I do my um, stretching and meditation, and then I record a podcast a couple of days a week. And what I've realized is I do that not just because I have to work through the day, but because that's actually the best time for my brain to work. And for recording these episodes, it really is best for me to use that same time. I keep thinking, well, I should do it on a Friday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon when I have um, time and space. But really, the, I need to make the time and space early in the morning here. What I'm going to do now is read from um, read from my book of essays. And um, you can buy a copy of these essays, and I would urge you to do so. I'm going to jump into the chapter, uh, which is towards the end. It's actually called Closing. But I speak for a page or two about uh, the haptics of the piano. So if I hold the book up a little bit, so at least I'm not staring down in my lap. All right. Uh, so here we are. This is actually from page 192 of the, of the book. Um, when I write music, I can't hear the notes. I don't sit at my desk and imagine a piece of music to be self-dictated and transcribed. I've never had a great ear and never really improved my sight singing and ear training exercises. I wasn't very good to start with and seemed singularly uninspired to get better. My uh, various teachers, faculty, professors will attest to that. Um, you'll probably be able to tell what's reading and what's me extemporizing. What I do get when I write is a sense of what it would feel like if my body were the shape of the piece, a sense of gesture. I'm not dancing, I mean, I'm not moving around, um, I don't visualize choreography or movement, but I do feel a muscular sensation that pulls and tugs in certain directions, it leaves me without breath for a moment, an overall balance of tension across all my joints. How else to put it? Uh, when I was a student in a geology course studying the landscape of Maine, I passed an exam not because I had studied but because when I read a question, I could answer the essay by thinking, what would I do, what would I do, if I were a glacier retreating? I passed a history of the French Revolution in the same way. If I were a radical commune, how would I move? My body isn't convulsed. There is no actual movement. If I could compose in haptics only, then I think I would. 
if I could isolate the media for the externalization of imagined physiological twitches and quivering, then that is the instrument I would compose for. Which is interesting. I think Messian is in that re in that way of thinking as well. Like he's pointing towards something behind the music. Right? Uh, elsewise, I have the piano. When I play piano, it is most important that I feel my fingers deep in the keys. I often find myself with my knee pressing up on the bottom of the keyboard while I play, regardless of dynamics. Remember I talked earlier about the weight, regardless of whether you're playing loud or soft. I always write at the piano. The exercise of compositional craft is to be able to recognize when I fit the right notes to the apperceived gestures. I love that word, apperception. I probably use it in all kinds of ways that's not appropriate. I like the word haptics as well, and I'm probably misusing that too. So, um, The apperception of haptics is synesthesia. That's how I define synesthesia. It's different. Today, I spent an hour trying to figure out a rhythm I'd been tapping with my fingers on the bus heading to work. I sat at my desk trying to figure it out and mark up a scratch piece of paper with gnomic reminders. Did I need to figure out a precise arrangement of triplets? Or could I mark a trill with license to ornament? There's something about the difference between an appoggiatura and a grace note that I think could define a big piece. I still think that. And I probably ask myself that question a lot. The difference between da dum and yi dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba da ba da ba da I think is it is probably the single most important compositional question that I answer. Um, the French pianist Alfred Courtauld developed a series of exercises where the hand is held at the bottom of the keys and the focus is on developing touch and tone through independent motion of each finger. So we heard some of that earlier. I, I think I did a podcast on that. Uh, I'll try and put a link to it here if it's on YouTube. Um, or I'll just link to it in the show notes. In these exercises, I place all five fingers of one hand at a time on contiguous keys and slowly depress each note so that the action triggers without sound, without actually striking the string. This pressure point deep in the action of the piano is the base position for all the exercises. Now lift the fingers in a series of precisely defined and increasingly complex patterns such that only the active finger is moving. All others stay pressed against the bottom of the lever. The arch of the knuckles must be competent. The arm shall be banking the full weight of the upper body, no matter how soft the sound or delicate the articulation. Then switch hands. Um, my teacher studied with Courteau at the Paris Conservatory in between the wars. She told me about hiding behind curtains to watch Dinu Lepati practice uh, Lepati, a favorite favorite pianist um, yeah I feel a real lineage through these exercises they have defined how I think about playing and then because of that how I think about composing when I was at home recuperating from a surgery that had impacted the hearing in the one ear that worked the first time I touched my piano, it sounded like ring modulation run through a distorted compress, like a Dalek. Then it stopped. I should be clear, my healing didn't heal. There is no ear left in there, it's this one here. My brain filled in the gaps. It still fills in the gaps. I know that I'm not hearing what my ears are rendering. When I meet someone for the first time, they sound like they are speaking with a lisp, but this is also still true. If I met you, you would sound like you had a lisp until my brain cleaned it up. This is because of the particular frequencies impacted by the hearing loss. If you see the results of my hearing tests, there's a dip in the center where I don't hear a range of frequencies either partially or correctly. But then after I talk to someone, to you, for a few days or meet them for a few times, it takes breaks away for everything to settle, not like a gradual slide over 25 minutes, more like three to four sessions separated by time away, like all good things, small pieces with time in between. This is why I'm so certain of the presence of a mind organ separate from the physical senses we arrive at through daily phenomena. A little bit of a shout out to Buddhism there. 
The feeling of the keys has always been the same, gentle and familiar. I recently had my piano recalibrated, a three-day process where the technician removes the workings of the piano and runs through dozens of minute adjustments down to a fraction of an inch. It was incredible, incredible to watch. Did you know that in order for the keys to feel the same when you strike one of the big bass strings or when you play one of the delicate highest notes, there's a built-in exponential adjustment across the piano that has to be taken into account. Unbelievable. I couldn't believe that. And I imagine if you play the forte piano, that isn't there, and the high notes will feel, the touch will feel different. The energy will feel different. Um, the keys don't behave all the same in order that they will feel the same. After that adjustment to the piano, my instrument had new depth and sensitivity to it. When I played, it was as if I were 29, 19 even, and never once had been dissected. The, the, phys the physiology of the instrument um, recalibrated was much more nuanced and reminded me of the instruments I'd played on as a young student, where, of course, at the university, they had beautiful Steinway instruments. Uh, the instrument I play up here is a nice upright, a Samic upright. Um, downstairs, I have a baby grand five-foot piano, which is not very nice, but it's not a Steinway. Um, there's a lot of recordings of me playing that piano. I'll, I'll link those. I'll link those here. Playlist. Music is a haptic phenomenon. I probably could have just started here, right? You're all thinking, Jesus, reading the whole fucking book. I'm not. This is the last page. Music is a haptic phenomenon, an experience of the kinesthetic mode. The haptic buzz is an epiphenomenon of the aesthetic object. Haptics appear to be part of our sensory metabolism, part of the synesthetic complex. But haptics extend the boundaries of the self. Ask where is the line between echo and silence, vibration and stillness. This line between mind and cosmos is permeable and subject to influence. This may all happen below the threshold of perception and manifest as glitches in the system, particularly when the system is the, is the brain, uh, and the brain with the piano is a system. Haptics are fleeting, froth on the breaking quantum wave. We can barely capture them in our hands, an access point to the overarching shape of the human form, not immortal, but resting outside of time. Messian's quartet for the end of time is not the not the dissolution of time, it's not the destruction of all things. It is the separation of time from all things. The splashes and residue of biologically sustained awareness, the mind perceiving itself, the intersection of memories, the collision of universes mediated by physiology, human bodies mediating human being, and then the, the piano being an exemplar of that. Sound models the body's perception of itself in a way that approaches the structure of the body from the slightest nerve action to the grossest forms of patterns, larger than the breath, larger than the diurnal pattern of eating, shitting, and sleeping. Sounds that exist at the same frequency as a lifetime, unbearable by our small, floppy ears. We say lower pitch, but it really means just plain longer. The time it takes for the wave peaks to reach our ears is too long. It is literally length and time perceived as sound. There is a sound wave with the same period as my life. My life is a sine wave with a period of one, punctuated and modulated by the ecstasy of sneezing, fucking, and dying. All right, keep your wits about you.